The revolution is real, it's live, and as some comrades say, it's lit, right? <laughs> Lit. Lit, lit. The revolution is lit. Yuhuru, comrades, and welcome to today's O'Malley Taught Me Sunday. to destroy it. It is clear that we must begin to seriously shape the ideological front of the African liberation movement. Our theory of African internationalism, <clears throat> developed by Chairman Amalia Oshitella, provides only legitimate explanation for the crisis we see in the world and we must begin to promote it. This is where our important apparatus of agitation and propaganda comes in to introduce and deepen the world view of the African working class, to make this the dominant theory of the African revolution. With the Department of Agitation and Propaganda successfully waging the war of ideas, it will be common practice to begin to be an African internationalist. We feel this is necessary in order to complete the revolution. It is my honor now to introduce the founder of this profound theory of African internationalism, one that continues to go beyond explaining the world but changing it. The greatest revolution, every theor theoretician of our time, Chairman Amalia Shatella. What a comrade. I want to just begin this by reminding us that these uh, studies that we do every Sunday now uh, were initiated in order to um, deal with the growing numbers of people who were coming into the African People's Socialist Party and also uh, particularly to deal with the Department of Agitation and Propaganda that has the responsibility of, of uh, developing and distributing the ideas of the party among the members of the party 
and uh, out into the world. And with so many new forces coming into the party, it became clear uh, that one of the things that we had to do as quickly as possible is to deepen the political and ideological development of people who are responsible for this uh, uh, incredible uh, entity that we call the Department of Agitation and Propaganda that is often referred to as the heart of the African People's Socialist Party. It is the organization or the committee in the party that is responsible for the production and distribution of our newspaper. It is the committee in the African People's Socialist Party that is responsible uh, for our radio stations, for uh, the political education within the African People's Socialist Party, and the development of a capacity uh, to uh, distribute uh, these ideas among masses of the African people, to draw more and more African people into uh, political uh, life, uh, into a deeper understanding of what the world that we are dealing with uh, is comprised of and what it's going to take for us to, uh, to win our freedom as a people. So this is not just uh, some kind of uh, exercise in uh, discussing ideas uh, uh, unto itself. Uh, we uh, do this as a part of the process to build revolution. And uh, I also just want to say that um, we are beginning on page 15 of this uh, political, of this uh, plenary uh, political report from 2017. Uh, this was a political report uh, that was, came following uh, the sixth Congress of our party. Uh, and the sixth Congress, uh, after every Congress of our party, uh, which, uh, which uh, is now scheduled, uh, for every five years, there is also uh, at least uh, 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 every year a, a plenary. It's a kind of planning uh, entity that we uh, have devised in order to check up on how we've done with the resolutions and, and uh, the mandates that came from our Congress and also to continue the development of our understanding and the work uh, that we were involved in going into our Congress and that uh, has to occur uh, subsequent to the Congress. And most of the work of the African People's Socialist Party uh, is work that is done uh, through committees. Uh, there are various uh, kinds of uh, committees that we've created in the Department of Agitation and Propaganda is one such committee, but there are others. Uh, and there are other organizations that we've created. And this is, these are the vehicles through which the work of the party um, uh, is done. And this is important because we are an organization of leaders. We, we firmly, strongly believe uh, in the question of leadership. We know that we won't have any kind of freedom if there is no leadership. And so uh, leadership is critical. And uh, we talk about leadership, and that's one way we talk about accountability. We talk about leadership that is responsive to and responsible for a plan. And the basic plan that we were working with coming into our 17th Congress was a plan that had come from, uh, immediately from uh, our, uh, our sixth uh, Congress, that is to say the plan from 2017, the plenary, the basic plan that we were working with is a plan that came from our, 2000, uh, from our seventh Congress. So that's what we were working with. And that's what every committee, every uh, organization of the party uh, was responsible for. That is, the, the mass organizations uh, such as the International People's Democratic, Democratic Uhura Movement, uh, which is the, the critical mass organization through which the party's face has expressed uh, um, uh, most uh, effectively, uh, most consistently throughout the world, uh, and the uh, various other departments and committees that uh, function uh, uh, with the responsibility of carrying out the party's uh, mandates uh, from the uh, Congress that we have every five years now. This question of leadership is not a small thing. As you will see uh, in this process, in this study that we are dealing with now, we will go through some of the committees and, and some of the uh, departments and organizations of the party responsible for carrying out the mission that, uh, that uh, we 
were committed to uh, from our six congressmen. And, and uh, in addition to having uh, individuals who are accountable uh, to the party and uh, responsible for this mission, we have, we have chairs and directors and, 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 and some instance presidents of different kinds of committees and organizations that we've created, we believe uh, strongly in collective leadership. As to say that uh, almost every individual who we can identify as a leader uh, leads a committee, leads an organization, and has the responsibility of pulling that committee, that organization, uh, into action uh, with a plan that was developed uh, specifically for that committee, that organization, uh, to be able to push forth the agenda that has come from our Congress. And one thing that makes this important is that the African People's Socialist Party uh, is held accountable by, by these political reports. There's a political report to our Congress, there are political reports uh, uh, to uh, some of the various other organizations, and then to the plenary, the planning uh, that uh, we do annually, in most instances, responding to uh, the Congress. And, and what they do is leave uh, evidence of what kinds of plans that we made, and it gives us something that we can use to measure whether or not we've been successful or not. They're not just talking about things and then it goes up in smoke. It happens or doesn't happen, and we're no longer accountable for it. Uh, this, this puts it on the record. This is one of the things that's distinguished us for a long time. Uh, there used to be an organization uh, that uh, was, was at the time quite well known and was uh, a U.S. based uh, African organization of sorts. And uh, one thing that it never did, it never published, it had a newspaper, it never published anything uh, that anybody could see that uh, would hold that organization accountable. It didn't have a constitution. Uh, that held the leadership accountable to the membership uh, and the membership accountable to the overall uh, program or direction uh, of the organization. And uh, this was one of the struggles that we would, uh, we did initiate uh, with that and other kinds of organizations saying that we have a greater responsibility. Uh, we have a responsibility to build an organization that outlasts and outlives um, uh, particular leaders that have uh, a, an ongoing, enduring uh, capacity. And so uh, we measure our success. We say uh, we've, we succeeded here, we failed here, we made an error here, and, and uh, we are in the process of fixing that, or this is how we plan to fix it. That's what, that's what much of this is about. And so I just want to say that, because uh, this discussion we have uh, today uh, deals with uh, these some of the committees uh, that we have for the party. And for some people, uh, this may not be interested or interesting at all. But for those of us who are committed to making this revolution, certainly, certainly in the, the African, African People's People Socialist Party, Party, certainly in the Uhuru movement, I think this is a very important discussion that we have. And we continue to remind ourselves of who we are and what it is that we have to do. We're not just a group of people who like each other and who uh, come together because uh, uh, we have uh, some gift of gab or because we enjoy each other's company, although much of that may be true. Uh, but there is work and, uh, that's organized around a plan that's responsive to a philosophy uh, that uh, informs everything that we do. And this is what measures our relationship to each other and gives us the ability to say whether we've been successful or not. And so I want to go ahead and start. I'm on page 15. It's been suggested, it's been stated already that we start off with the discussion of the Department of Agiprop, but it goes beyond that. And you will see as we go through this that there have been changes in, in, uh, within the Department of Agiprop. And some of the things that we assumed uh, uh, would uh, happen in this department uh, did not happen the way we thought it was going to happen. We've made changes since that time, as we will make changes. Uh, every time we find that we made an error, we won't hesitate to fix it. And uh, even if some people say having fixed it is a demonstration of some kind of weakness, what we say is having identified it, 
fixed it is not a demonstration of weakness, but it, it is something about the sincerity of our effort to make a revolution. That's what it's about. So beginning on page 15, under the subhead, Department of, Agitation, of Agiprop must wage the war of ideas. The, department's, the party's Department of Agitation and Propaganda, Agiprop, is our primary organization for waging the war of ideas that we are permanently confronted with as a people and as a party, a war of ideas. They're the ideas of our oppressor that, that impacts us on a daily basis that, that helps to influence and inform sometimes the ideas, and perhaps most times, perhaps all the time, are more dangerous than the guns, are more dangerous than the cops on the streets who shoot our children down on a daily basis because if we have the right ideas about what happened, if we can contend with the ideas that's imposed on us that justifies this, that explains this in the, uh, to the benefit of our oppressor, then we can move forward. I, I just uh, saw something uh, recently, and I've been seeing this uh, phenomenon that's uh, related to some kind of uh, Afro-descendants of slave or some, something similar to that, something uh, and and uh, I was looking at the, they call themselves some kind of Afro descendant nation or some something to this extent. And some people have said, well, that's the police. They uh, uh, they've been created by some uh, interintelligence organization. I don't know. That could be the case. I mean, uh, but that's not what makes them so dangerous. Even though that would make them dangerous, what makes them dangerous are the ideas that they promote. And those ideas. Uh, ideas that, that go against everything that we're involved in that we have to do in order to overturn our oppression and destroy a system of oppression. It's the ideas, whether they come directly from the police, uh, from the state, or not. And they may come from the state because the state would impose bad ideas and ideas that send us astray into our a movement to keep us confused, to keep us in the swamps. The, the government, the intelligence organization would do that. They do it every day with our schools and our movies and that we go to and things like that. Sometimes even the music that you listen to uh, uh, is music and the movies that you see are movies that have actually been purchased by intelligence organizations and put forth. This is something that we know has happened uh, in the past and we sure it happens today. But the main thing is to arm ourselves and arm the people around the ideas. Because if you have something, first of all, this whole concept of being descendants of slaves is, uh, is extraordinary because we're not descendants of slaves. If we were descendants of slaves, then that already demolishes the idea of getting reparations. If you, why would you get reparations if you uh, uh, were a slave when you met this guy? If you were already a slave, how, what are you getting reparations for? That destroys the idea, neutralizes the idea of reparations. We're not descendants of slaves. We're descendants of free people who were enslaved by imperialists. And guess what? In order to get us into Mississippi and other places to enslave us, they had to go where? To Africa. And to go to Africa, they had to make a war and assault on Africa to steal us and bring us here. So if we talk about reparations for African people, it can't start on a plantation in Mississippi. It has to start at the origin of the contradiction, which is in Africa. And it has to go everywhere the Africans were, were brought to were on the gun, on the gun, at gunpoint uh, through the rest of the world, whether that's in Haiti or Mississippi. That's, the kind, that's what, why that's so dangerous. And then to come forth like this Afro-descendant plan that they are putting forth, some kind of plan that we got to make sure that our tax money goes to fixing our schools and, and, and uh, we can have, so fix our police departments and, and, uh, and then we can share the money from state to state inside the United States. What kind of plan is that? That's a, part, that's a plan of the Republican Party, the Democratic Party. Our problem is not that we don't get money to share among ourselves. Our problem is that we live under a social system that came into existence by depriving us as a people the right to take care of ourselves and control our own land, our own resources, our own culture, and our own labor. Somebody has stolen that from us. Somebody has forcibly 
put us in all these different places, given us false national consciousness, so we run around telling we're some kind of Afro descendants of slaves, uh, as opposed to recognize that we are African people. This is what we mean in terms of war of ideas. That's part of what we mean. We mean what comes from the Republican Party. We mean what comes from the Democratic Party. We mean what comes from liberals. We mean what comes from so-called socialists. We mean sometimes what comes from revolutionaries. That's why we have to have a science that gives us the ability to really investigating and analyzing our reality and to be able to look at our situation in the world and predict a future based on what we know we can do under, if we move in a fashion that's consistent uh, with, with how history is trying to unfold. So uh, this area, that is to say the Department of Agitation and Propaganda is probably known as the Department of Agiprop or DAP within our party and the movement. Agiprop is a huge and complex uh, operation that suffered many years from not having enough members, and as we have developed, not having clarity of mission and organizational coherence. We've, we, sometimes in Agiprop, we're not clear of what our mission, and sometimes we were organization incoherent. We didn't have, we hadn't pulled the organization together to carry out what had to be done. We didn't utilize the organization in a fashion that was consistent uh, with how we had to move. That we developed manuals and things like that to try to take that kind of question on. Every day, new members are, are clamoring to become part of our party through Agipro. The the department has grown tremendously over the last two years. Comrade uh, Timba Shabanda, who relocated from his home in Chicago to our party's headquarters in Florida, is playing an important role in leading the uh, Department of Agitation and Propaganda. Comrade Timber is another of the new party members entrusted with a huge responsibility. New party member, and then given this incredible responsibility of heading the Department of Agitation and Propaganda. New party member, somebody uh, at a time after uh, more than two generations of not being involved, that is to say our people, not being involved in revolutionary activity, not, uh, 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 and, and most of our revolutionary organizations haven't been destroyed, uh, now uh, we bring this comrade into the party. Where does he come from? Where do we meet this comrade from? We said he came from Chicago, but where did we meet Comrade Timber as an organization? Ferguson, in August 2014, where our movement was coming back to life as a consequence of those courageous, young, working-class Africans on Canfield Drive who responded to the police murder of Mike Brown, 18-year-old Mike Brown. And so people came in, and some of our comrades from Chicago brought this comrade with them uh, to, uh, uh, to Ferguson, Missouri, and this is where we come into contact with this comrade. So we say that, uh, and he was a new member, and he, he, was, he was willing to come into Florida to take on this work, and we were impressed with Timber because of his enthusiasm, because he was willing to do that, and because he had some knowledge of radio in particular, and how to do radio, and we knew we were going to be doing a lot with radio. Uh, Agiprop includes the Brenningsville newspaper, Black Power 92.3 FM radio station, and a distribution component. Within the Brenningsphere alone, there are 30 or more people uh, on the team. Uh, the Department of Agitation and Propaganda also carries the responsibility for inter-party political and ideological development. This department establishes the lines of organization throughout the entire party and Uhuru movement. And what we mean is that Agiprop doesn't exist only as something on the top of a pyramid. pyramid. It, it establishes its tentacles throughout the party. There's a there's an international agiprop component in leadership, but in every national organization, uh, whether that's in Kenya, whether that's in, in uh, South Africa, whether that's in London or any other place or in the United States, every, there also has to be agiprop departments that's under its leadership. Uh, and in every national organization, uh, there are regional organizations uh, for the most part. And then there are district organizations. Uh, and then there are local party organizations. And the Agiprop has to be structured that it 
works as tentacles reach into every one of these areas. That's the thing that gives us organizational coherence and that gives us organization, period. Uh, that means that we can make a decision uh, that comes out of Ferguson uh, and Canfield Drive that can go all the way uh, to, uh, um, uh, to uh, Johannesburg in South Africa for that matter, or Nairobi in Kenya or uh, uh, someplace else uh, in the world. So uh, this department establishes the lines of organization throughout the entire party and Uhuru movement. This is only a thumbnail sketch of Ajapop's role, but it is a, a statement of the enormity of the task assumed by Comrade Timba uh, to lead uh, this department. Uh, Timba has fought tooth and nail to improve his own political, ideological, organization, and technical competence as a leader of this work, in the process of struggling to move the department forward more than anyone else in the past. Timba has withstood sometimes blistering criticism for his shortcomings and errors, but he has persevered, and his stance is one to be emulated. And, and his stance is one to be emulated. And one of the things that we, because Timba's no longer the, over at Japrop, he couldn't, he couldn't do that. Uh, uh, but he is over the 96.3, the radio station. We didn't know. We thought, we, we hoped he could do it. Uh, and he was enthusiastic about trying to do it. He was willing to do what most people are not willing to do, to leave his hometown and then to come to move all the way across the country and take on the responsibility. And it's not paid. It's not like you make money doing this. And so we say, right on. We got a good comrade who can take this on. But he couldn't hack it. As the leadership even though he has made, done marvelous things with the radio station more than anybody else has done with the radio station. But we didn't know that he couldn't hack it. And when he, and he, we criticized him throughout this process. Timber faced, as we say, in the political report, blistering criticism. And then, uh, and you know what, he never cried. He never uh, said, I'm picking up my marbles. He never said, I'm so sensitive, I'm so, uh, important. I'm so significant that I can't participate in an organization that believes in criticism, self-criticism, because he understood that the question of the part of issue of criticism was not blaming, but fixing, identifying, and fixing a contradiction, fixing a problem. And he was able to unite, and this is what made Timber such an important force. And one of the reasons it was important for Timber to be criticized because we knew we had in Timber somebody who could deal with criticism and be loyal to the party, be loyal to the revolution, be loyal to the people, and not go off someplace and start screaming and attacking the party because we did what the party's supposed to do. It's in the principles of the organization, democratic centralism, criticism, self-criticism. Not only do we criticize, but we expect someone who makes errors to criticize themselves and their work so that they can help to fix the problem too and perhaps get somebody in, the, in, in their stead who can do the work. That's one of the things that made us appreciate Tim and that's one of the reasons it was easy for me uh, to criticize Tim because I want that to be an example for other people who are in the work. See this comrade, see this comrade deal with criticism. That's a whole different discussion and study that we should be having. But I think it's important. One of the reasons I left this in for the study today is because I wanted to be able to show this is what we said then. This is what we said then. We said Timber's going to be over this work, and then we said he had contradictions. And we moved even further, and we talk about other people who were responsible. For example, uh, 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 Kolonda Mulamba, uh, who was appointed editor-in-chief of the Burning Spear, did great work, was, was very smart. Uh, on top of a lot of stuff, but we also make uh, criticism. We said that um, uh, uh, there are struggles with Comrade Colonda's work that sometimes include a hint of commandism and dogmatism. These are contradictions that owe themselves, we said, to inexperience and struggling to carry out her mission as leader of the party's most important tool for propagating our ideas. But then we go on to say, moreover, we said, a little dogmatism in this arena can be a good thing, certainly better than the liberalism that has historically haunted this department. So it's the department that's haunted with liberalism, indecision, uh, in the, in, in just incoherence, etc. And so we swing from one end of the pendulum back over to the other end of the pendulum. But we identified it as a contradiction. We identified the contradiction, and so we, uh, we know what we're looking at. And that's one of the reasons why we do this in political reports so that we know what we're looking at. It's not just my opinion. 
It's the opinion of the organization because this political report was something that was adopted, voted on, discussed, and voted on by the entire party. So we identify contradictions. And one of the reasons we identify them in such a fashion so that the entire organization can be aware of the contradiction so that when they see this contradiction rising up, they can participate. This is collective leadership. They can participate in criticizing and helping to correct the contradiction. You see what we're saying? So, uh, and so, you know, we said, and Colonna did some really important work, but, but the dogmatism that we identified um, uh, and some of the other contradictions uh, meant that she uh, did not uh, end up handling that work and uh, well, wasn't capable of handling that work. Uh, and, and, uh, but now the work is, is being led by comrade uh, Akile. And, uh, and people here have seen Akile. And, they, and one thing that helps us with Akile, see, Timba and Kalonda, we did not know and had no experience with. And even though they were bright and, and willing people uh, to take on certain aspects of the work, uh, our introduction to them was that they, when they came into the party proper. That's not the same thing. And by the way, that's an issue that's being struggled with by comrades, particularly in South Africa and other places. Uh, uh, how do we get to know some of these forces before they are put in these uh, serious areas of responsibility? And sometimes you can't. You really can't. Uh, because uh, we talked about more than two generations uh, after the revolution was, after Malcolm killed, King killed, the Black Panther Party destroyed, and it was destroyed much earlier than its formal demise uh, in the 80s. Uh, organizations all around us, uh, uh, thousands of people jailed, et cetera, movement crushed down. And uh, uh, after all of this, and then we go for almost two generations, Revolution not on the agenda. We're the ones who are pushing revolution on the agenda. In fact, the title of this plenary and the plenary report is what? Putting revolution back on the agenda. That's the fight that we've been engaged in all this time. And in a time where many were satisfied with, many who call themselves revolutionaries, I knew them and have known them since the 1960s. But they have not been trying to build revolution. They've been building so-called, they've been, they're, Work has primarily been building coalitions of some sort, primarily dealing single issue questions. They've gone back to the civil rights period in some instances. And we said, we're not going to do civil rights movement again. We're going to build a party that's capable of doing the kinds of work that civil rights organizations have done that bring people into political life, giving us an opportunity under the leadership of the African working class and the philosophy of African internationalism, giving them the ability to grow the revolution from that perspective as opposed to starting all over and then starting off and going through civil rights and whatever until the next attack by the United States government. And this coming is here, in fact, uh, on a regular basis. So I want to move forward to page 19. And on page 19, uh, we're looking at uh, the subtitle, uh, Parties Economic and Political uh, part is economic work, and then we say the political and economic are one. And I wanted to go through that first part because I think it's really important, as I said, uh, part of it is to be able to say that we have moved consistently. We have consistently tried to solve the problems of the revolution. And we're also saying that in the process of doing that, uh, we sum up, uh, we give ourselves something by which we measure our activity, our work, and then individual leaders, that we sum them up in the process of doing this because somebody has to lead the work. And this is one of the difficult decisions that people often make, but this is one of the real uh, things that help us to understand the question of leadership, uh, being able to, uh, to select a proper cadre leadership to be over the work, and then checking up to make sure that the work happens the way it's supposed to happen. We're talking about building a revolutionary organization. This is not uh, some kind of talk fest. This is not uh, something that we do to get a lot of likes uh, on Facebook or something to that effect. We're talking about liberating our people who've lived under uh, this horrible oppression for at least the last 600 years and haven't assumed out for ourselves the responsibility to end it to say that not another generation will live as slaves because we have the advantage of the African People's Sources Party, something that other generations before us did not have. 
we're not starting from the place where I started as somebody who was doing political work, uh, where I had to discover the revolution. In fact, what we found is that there were so many people who were involved in civil rights and this kind of work uh, that at some time in the process, sometime through, through the oppression that we experienced, we learned that, hey, it's going to take a revolution to free us. So it was spontaneously that we had to say, let's build a revolution. Now, with the a, example, the ability of the party coming into existence at the tail end of the defeat of the Re black revolution of the 60s, we didn't start off saying, let's get some civil rights. We started off saying, let's make revolution. We have to have revolution. This is the only way forward. So I'm not going back to civil rights stuff. I might create a civil rights type organization that help other people to get where they need to be so that we can move this project forward. But I'm not, we're not going to have a whole movement based on civil rights anymore. We're not going to do a hands up, don't shoot, black lives matter kind of civil rights stuff and cover it up with some kind of radical rhetoric. We're building a capacity to make a revolution. And that's what we go through this process about on a regular basis now. <laughs> on page 19, we say part is economic work. Political and economic are one. The economic work of the party has made uh, tremendous leaps ever, uh, ever since our sixth Congress. The Office of Deputy Chairwoman Ona Zene Ishitela has been most effective and conscientious in carrying out the mandates coming from the sixth Congress political report. This is one of the most important committees of the party, departments of the party. I don't say this just because the critical role that economics play. That's, that's enough reason to say it. But because it's one of the most efficient. It is uh, a department that has assumed the responsibility of leadership, of, have assu has assumed the responsibility of the success of the entire revolution, of the entire party, not just saying what they can or cannot do, but even going beyond what we would assume they can do, even making, finding sacrifices to make, not running from problems, but even finding the problems so that we can solve them before they kick us in the teeth and what have you. And this and uh, another committee that we'll speak to uh, before this end, there are two who've been fundamentally important. And one reason that they've been important is because they have literally taken the political report and examined it, stripped it bare, and then discovered how from their area of responsibility can we push this, this revolutionary revolution process forward? How can I develop this area of the work here in relationship to all the other work, uh, areas, in relationship to the party's project? How can I develop this place where I'm standing right now to make the revolution happen uh, to prepare us for the task of governing, which is what it's all about. And that's what, that's what this department has done. And it doesn't mean that everything is done is correct or even done nicely, because uh, uh, it's never been done before. And so we are uh, carving out this path. But one thing we know for sure, that what is informing or even misinforming the work that's being done here is the political report, the mandates, the resolutions. This is where it's coming from, not just some thing that sprung from, from her head by itself, but it's an attempt to carry out the mission that our Congress defined, our plenary uh, uh, helped us to, to refine, uh, et cetera. That's the thing that make that, makes this uh, such an important area of work. There's one other like that uh, also. And, uh, and the other thing about it is uh, being, a f being uh, courageous enough to lead. Because some people don't have the courage to lead because they don't have the courage to make mistakes and be accountable for mistakes. So if you're too fearful of making a mistake, you never will lead anything. You just try to hide in the dark and not do anything. Uh, but having the courage to take it and, 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 and be aware that I might make a mistake. And if you make a mistake, what's going to happen? Criticism, criticism, criticism. But if you're successful, what's going to happen? <laughs> Praise, <laughs> you know, uh, et cetera. So uh, we say that uh, 
Not only has the deputy chair uh, transformed the economic work, she has taken literally the understanding of our party's slogan that the economic and political work are one. Since the Congress, she has struggled to bring the economic work to virtually every committee and department of the party. Since the Congress, she has struggled to bring the economic work to virtually every committee and department of the party. Both our fifth and sixth Congresses mandated this. What's so important about that? It's recognition that what we are doing with all of the committees, with all of the areas of work that we're doing is that we are replicating ourselves a thousand times over so that you can attack one area of the party and you may even be successful in crushing it, but you haven't crushed the party. Because every other committee, every other local organization, every other regional organization, every other entity that we've created is, is the party in, in miniature, uh, minuscule, and that can grow out and become the African Revolution all over again. Do you see? So that's what's really important to say. She has introduced and demanded the science and discipline uh, required by, her economic by our economic institutions into every area of the party. She has taken organizational economic training everywhere possible within all the structures of our party and movement, more than any other the, the work that, uh, 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 any other area of the work that of Deputy Chair Ishitella demands emulation. Every area of party work has benefited from the leadership of the Deputy Chair. In part, this is because of her fidelity to the political reports and mandates from our party, our congresses, and plenaries, but also because of the constant utilization of the organizational manual and other directives that she helped uh, uh, to organize or develop. Another thing that has influenced the impact of the leadership of, and I'm saying all of this is because, precisely because it's something that can be emulated and should be emulated. Every area of the party's work should reflect this kind of determination, this kind of dedication, this kind of discipline, uh, this kind of unity. And unity is more than a damn word. You know, if we have come from a Congress and voted this is what we're going to do, this is the political report that's going to inform our work, here are the mandates, here are the resolutions, unity is more than saying I unite, unity is carrying it out. And that's, what, that's who we are. We, we say sometimes that we are not what we say, we are what we do. And there has to be this relationship, unity of thinking and doing is, is what we are talking about. Uh, unity of, uh, of, of theory and practice is what we are talking about. This is the thing that gives the African People's Socialist Party uh, the edge that we need to win. Uh, another thing that has influenced the impact of the leadership provided by Deputy Chair Owner Zanea should tell us the fact that the economic work by its very nature demands concrete manifestations of success. Smooth talking, filibustering, or plain old BS won't suffice. Economic work and running institutions demand planning and concrete results. You gotta pay the rent. You gotta make payroll. You gotta do all these other kinds of things. You can't talk that away. You gotta even pay bourgeois colonial taxes. Even Jesus recognized that when he said, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto whoever what is theirs. You understand? Uh, and, and, and in response to the tax question. So as long as we're living under colonialism, and, and so this is an, an area of science. You have to have a certain kind of practice. And that's why this influence throughout the party structures is so important. It ain't messing with you. It's trying to say that this takes the BS out of the game and it requires actual accomplishment. It requires results. That's what we're looking at, results. Did you get to make the payroll resources? Did you <clears throat> do what has to do to get the members? What, <clears throat> you say well, there are no members, you brought in no new members, you sold no newspapers. What in the hell, why didn't you? This is what the mandate calls for. <clears throat> and this is the science that's so important that's been introduced uh, through this office. This approach to le leadership has benefited our party in virtually every facet of the work and helped to create a disciplined infrastructure throughout the organization. Almost all of our institutions are thriving under her leadership. Uh, they have uh, broken through that what appeared to be uh, barriers of stagnation that existed before her leadership uh, took them to new heights, United today, limited uh, today only by lack of availability 
or, or, or of common, competent cadre. And that's a problem. Also, that we, we identify and say that's a problem. Lack of competent cadre is something that we have to struggle to win. We're not trying to put on some kind of uh, show of being this perfect entity. We're not. We engage in the struggle. That's why we have criticism, self-criticism, to become more perfect with every go-around, to become better at what it is that we do and identify uh, uh, contradictions and annihilate them. Now, annihilate the contradiction. You can't go forward unless you deal with contradiction. Contradictions are natural. Contradictions are normal. And we don't run from them, nor should we hide them. We have to look at them, expose them, because that's the only way we can progress. And some people would like to use the contradictions that we have identified ourselves in the party as a, tax, as a means to attack the party. Where others cover up contradictions, we try to expose contradictions so that we can move forward and learn from them. And if there is an underdeveloped consciousness in the mass of African people, they too can be convinced that a contradiction itself is evidence of something being wrong with the party. In addition to the ongoing development of the party's economic activity, other areas of the mass work are also adopting economic development institutions. They too will flourish uh, if the leaders of the work take full advantage of the expertise offered by the office of the deputy chair. And if the leaders are prepared to do everything necessary to succeed. So uh, the party's economic institutions are not only significant for what they bring directly to the party and party related organizations and committees. They are also important to what they bring to the masses of our people beyond the possibility of employment. Our economic institutions are also important for what they represent uh, to the psyche of Africans who may have lost collective self-confidence as a result of the cruelty of colonial capitalism that denies Africans the ability to easily initiate successful life-creating or economic ventures. So these, these are really important institutions and, 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 you know, so as a consequence of this activity and leadership from this department, now uh, there is uh, a department, an economic department inside the International People's Democratic Rural Movement that's busy, should be busy, learning how to be more effective and dedicated to not only carrying out the obvious political task of the International People's Democratic Rural Movement, but replicating the economic capacity that contributes to uh, uh, deepening uh, uh, our ability uh, to uh, create anti-colonial economic activity and also uh, giving us a well-rounded uh, uh, organizational uh, approach to everything. We said that in, in that that's uh, NPDUM, that's uh, uh, Anwar, the African National Women's Organization. It too has an economic uh, component and front that must be given appropriate attention because we're building this on every front. And then there's also the African, uh, All African People's Development Empowerment Project. It too, and the economic fronts that we're talking about are becoming more significant uh, in various communities throughout this country and, and in the world. And uh, this is a part of the process that we are creeping up on a real ability uh, to compete. Uh, this is what we call dual power, dual and contending power, make our own power. We're not just complaining about what white power does, even as we are complaining, even as we are demonstrating against it when necessary, we are also building a capacity of our own so that white power becomes less significant in the lives of African people and less capable of intervening in the lives of African people and less necessary to the existence of African people. And I say necessary, what I'm talking about is that if you don't have an economic capacity, you're in trouble. If white folks stop making or the system stops making toothpaste and, and, and toilet paper, uh, we're in trouble. We have to have the capacity to do everything for ourselves. And some of the smallest things uh, uh, are things that we have to take advantage of. Even in our uh, other aspects of our life that we take so much for granted. You know, I mean, you can't even get, your, women can't even get your nails done without going to, to, to some shop that's owned by someone else outside of your community. I'm not saying this as some kind of anti-Vietnamese, etc. I'm saying this because it is an area of economic activity that African people need to be able to control that there's so much of our resources go in the areas of hair and, 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 and other kinds of cosmetic. And I understand this because cosmetology and cosmetic comes from Africa, comes from Egypt, comes from, it wasn't, didn't exist 
before we created it, and yet, after creating it, just like so much of what we do, especially with capitalism, once we created something, it becomes a commodity that can even be used against the ones who created it. Right. You understand what we're saying? So, our economic uh, institution speaks, speak to the possibilities of Africans to achieve economic self-reliance, to be in charge of our own affairs. Every day that a young African passes our fitness center, or one of our furniture stores, or experiences our food and pies enterprise, walks into the door of our consignment store, makes a purchase of clothing from our clothing store, Uzi, reads our newspaper, or hears our radio station, that African experiences a sense of self-capacity and self-worth that is constantly under attack by the normal existence as a colonial subject. Think about that. This is what the party does. <clears throat> the party's leadership must still be one to fully understand the relationship of our economic work to the struggle for total liberation of our Africa and the forcible dispersed African nation. Our cadre must take over leadership from the solidarity forces who still coordinate many of our older institutions. Many people think of revolutionary work as comprising only the adrenaline pumping anti-colonial political demonstrations <clears throat> or the organization to push back the state after the latest atrocities committed against our people. But comrades, all politics is concentrated economics. But comrades, all politics is concentrated economics. We struggle not for the sake of struggle, but for the ability to rest away from our oppressors, the ability to fully manage, to, to fully engage in the production of life the ability to feed, clothe, and house ourselves as a nation, to have the advantage of the value we have created for our oppressors to change the material conditions of existence of our people. We struggle to end our relationship to capitalist parasitism, to end our relationship to a, a, a voracious, blood-sucking economic system that requires our permanent political and economic prostration for its success. That's what we are fighting for. That's what the struggle is about. Even the question of culture. You know, because I hear people complaining about the hip hop, this, and whatever other stuff is happening with our culture. But the fact is that we live under a colonial capitalist system, which means that even what is produced by the colonized is a commodity at the advantage of the capitalists who control our lives. So that means even the music that you make is a commodity. Where it used to be our culture, it is now something that is produced for sale. And even so-called artists, hip-hop and other ones, they, don't, they, they are conscious now that they're making this to sell it. They are conscious and they know what they have to say to sell it. They know what kind of garbage they have to spew to sell it. Because otherwise, the imperialist corporations won't take it. And they are the ones who control it. Do you see? So we're looking at a very serious question when we talk about economics. It controls virtually everything, especially colonial capitalist economics. Our economic work is the most revolutionary work we are engaged in. Our political work is work to help us achieve and maintain the ability of our people to acquire better material existence through liberating the productive forces of our nation. Our political work is work to help us achieve and maintain the ability for our people to acquire a better material existence through liberating the productive forces of our nation. And that's something that's really important for us to understand. And uh, the same rules of discipline apply within the sphere of, when we talk about the significance of economic work, some people mistake that to simply mean that you can't Organize. you can't do the work unless you don't have some money. No, we mean more than that. Because if that's what all we were doing, uh, then just a few fun, fundraisers every now and then to be able to get some flyers printed or to pay the rent or something would be sufficient. We are talking about more than that. We are talking about acquiring the capacity to feed, clothe, and house ourselves, and not just feed, clothe, and house ourselves, to do it to the beat. You understand? We're talking about uh, control of the culture and every other aspect of life that has been commodified by our relationship to imperialist white power. The same rules of discipline apply within uh, the sphere of economic work as, as they do elsewhere. 
The same sacrifices are required in pursuit of our economic objectives as elsewhere. I mean, think about this. The willingness of people to go out and face the police and do other kinds of things and maybe go to jail. You know, you see that. All, go to jail, stand up in, in front of the police and, and, and their guns and all that. People, in a minute, heartbeat, ready to do that. But the grueling, mind-numbing work to build these economic institutions, that's where the real sacrifice comes. That's where you make a decision of whether you're going to go to the ball game or whether you're going to take your child to the picnic or whether you're going to do the damn work to help build us out of the situation we're in so that your child and his and your child's child, children, will be able to have a quality life. You understand? And because even the damn baseball game that you're taking the child to is something that's under the authority of the colonial powers. No greater responsibility can be found than in the concrete, quantitatively measured work to raise up the conditions of the suffering colonized children of the whole African nation. So, I mean, again, it's so easy to get pumped up about the next demonstration, pumped up about the next mobilization of some sort, and be able to actually put your life on the line to do it. We've seen comrades do that. We've seen, we know of comrades willing to do that at the drop of a hat. But the grueling day-to-day -day work to build these institutions, to build these organizations of the party, that's where the real sacrifice comes in. In fact, sometimes the colonized look for reasons to die. So just being excited about facing a cop is just simply sometimes a way to end the misery a lot more quickly when we say the real way to end the misery is to dig in and uh, overturn this whole social system. Yeah. yeah. I'm impressed by my comrade Hugh P. Newton uh, and how I think in many instances, um, in some instances, what he did and what he wrote was a reflection of the ability of African people uh, to volunteer to die. I mean, he, like revolutionary suicide, uh, to die for the people. I mean, this, this thing, Africans have death on our minds all the time, our death. I remember uh, hearing of how Malcolm X made a presentation in one place, and he asked uh, the people in the room, uh, in the audience where he spoke, how many people in here are willing to die for their freedom? And everybody raised their hands. And then he said, well, how many people here are willing to kill for your freedom? And just six, seven people raised their hand and said, you six, seven better kill the rest of them because if you're not ready to kill for it, you know, uh, uh, they're going to be a problem. So it's easy for us to, to talk about dying for our freedom. Uh, and sometimes death is a relief. You know it's a relief. That's why this fascination with churches and praying and God take me and uh, the, the, the shootings and the uh, drugs. And the, when I say drugs, that include alcohol and cigarettes and the whole bit. Uh, always looking for a way to relieve ourselves from this oppression that we experience. That's why we are uh, anti-drugs, why we don't do, somebody say, well, <clears throat> they don't mess with us because we say they can't have marijuana, and they used to do marijuana in Africa or something like that. That ain't got nothing to do with it. The point is we are materialists. And the way, and why do people do alcohol? And why do people do drugs? It's to escape from this reality, even if it's only for a few minutes, just to get this reality. And we're saying, the real way to escape from this reality, take the time that you would take to get high, uh, to make the revolution, to build uh, something to end this misery, get high off the revolution. Fred Hampton used to always talk about high, high, high off the revolution. Get high off the revolution. That's my high. Anyway, I got to move through this thing because I've wasted so much time, not wasted, but spent so much time just dealing with a couple of pages and I have to go beyond this. So. I want us to uh, really um, look at this question of economics and because the party has done a tremendous amount of work here and because you know there are nationalists of certain sorts always talking about uh, economics and uh, you know they um, you know um, will uh, create their little uh, food stores or something else like that and say black power uh, and it doesn't necessarily mean black power because we say that our economic work is a part of our struggle for dual and contending power. 
We say that we live in a hostile, colonial, imperialist, white power, and that we have to end it. And part of the process of ending this relationship is to build our own power. But it's not just a power that will coexist exist with imperialist white power. It contends with, it competes with, it has as its objective the defeat of colonial white power. This is what dual power is all about. If it's not about that, you're just BSing. That's like them Afro-descendant people who talk about getting some of the tax monies and, and uh, helping to uh, have our own schools and pay for our own police. So that you can have your own schools and pay for your own police and you can live with some some ridiculous uh, illusion that somehow uh, you've come so smart uh, that you're going to do what no other Africans have been able to do and get America uh, to do right by African people on the one hand, but even if that were true, you're talking about an America that is in extreme crisis now, why? Because it finds it more difficult every day to control the people of South America to control the people in the Middle East, to control people in Africa and other places around the world. So even if you were successful in winning your little piece of the white man's pie, then that piece of pie can only exist as long as America continue to steal from what's ever in South America, steal from Africa, steal from the Middle East, steal from the oppressed peoples around the world, and most of us don't want anything to do with that kind of life. So that's BS. I want to just say something quickly, and hopefully I can, um, I want because I got to get out of here and get to another part of the work. So we say that uh, we must do the political work to enlist the masses of our people to conscious anti-colonial participation in our economic work. Some people, pseudo-leftists, would criticize us, claiming that this work means that we are capitalists. They would have African people remain as starving, unemployed dependents of colonial capitalism. What they do not seem to understand is that capitalism is when the means of production are privately owned and controlled by individuals and corporations that extort surplus value or profit for their own benefit. None of our institutions fit that description. All our institutions are truly owned by the people through the party, not any individual. In fact, socialism is that early stage of communism before the total elimination of the state, when the workers who produce value have socialized ownership of the means of production, have socialized ownership of the means of production, Socialism does not mean that production no longer occurs. It means that now socialized production is socially owned. We must win the masses politically to support our economic institutions. These embryonic manifestations of an independent anti-colonial African economy. But we must also do more to lead our people in our approach to economic self-reliance and political self-determination. I, as a child, I, I was talking to my younger brother just a few days ago, but as a child, the community I grew up in, the, there was some uh, African economic activity in the communities. Uh, and then uh, in the community I grew up in, uh, Jews were uh, the only white people who would work uh, do have businesses in the African community. That was below most of the other white people. So Jews used this as a stepping stone for themselves to enter into uh, bourgeois society proper. But they, 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 there was, uh, in my community, there was a, a grocery store owned by an African man named Mr. Hughes, right there on the corner. And uh, maybe one store down, uh, was a store that was owned by, it, we call it the white store. And it was white store because white people. And, uh, uh, and my mama would tell me to go to buy such and such a thing and to go to the white store, right? I was told to go to the white store. And, and 
uh, I would go to the white store, but you had to duck Mr. Hughes, because if Mr. Hughes saw you passing his store, to go to the white store, he would give you hell. And, and uh, so here I am crawling, you know, past Mr. Hughes' store, and then we complained because Mr. Hughes' store was always stale. Stuff was always stale. Of course, it was always stale because he held his inventory so long because Africans were not buying from him. But I didn't have the political education to understand what it meant. Mr. Hughes was not a bad man. He was not someone like these clowns we know now in our communities who call themselves capitalists and, 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 and engage in owning stores and stuff and who treat the people so badly and stuff. Mr. Hughes wasn't that guy. He was an ordinary guy. He was really from the community. And he was saddened also by the fact that Africans would pass him by to go to the white store. And I'm saying that you know, political education could have helped me. I would have, I would have known better. I would have been informed by what I was doing. It was just two stores and which one you go to. You know, and, and the white store, you could buy uh, uh, chicken necks. They would give you free chicken legs and, and frickin chicken necks, you understand, and that your mother would cook with rice and stuff like that. And this is what the white store would do. Mr. Hughes didn't even have the capacity to sell meats and stuff like that. But every other thing that you wanted, you could get it from Mr. Hughes if you didn't go to Mr. Hughes, and his stuff sat up on the shelves all the time. Uh, and it got bad, because I didn't have political education. I didn't know. It's our responsibility to inform our community. Uh, that, and, and Mr. Hughes didn't ha have the ability to tell me that this is a part of a project that to get us free, to liberate us from this project. And even if, son, if you stay here and purchase stuff here, I don't have the ability to get meat now, but if you keep, if you spend your money here, then I will be able to do it and then that will be better off for the rest of us. He wasn't able to do that. He didn't have that kind of consciousness and it won't happen naturally and normally. Right. It can only happen as a consequence of a revolutionary party fighting for communism, fighting for socialism, fighting for the overturn of the social system. That's the only thing that would have made it possible for Mr. Hughes to do what I'm talking about and for it to have made any difference. <coughs> so uh, our desperate colonial plight has required Africans to engage in what is often called informal or underground economic activity. This has included everything from established markets that allow independent vendors to provide goods uh, for the people at lower prices, to baked goods and other food sold from our homes. Sometimes African utilized mobile shops from the boot uh, or trunk of their cars. You know, and I don't know how true it is now, but there used to be people in our community who baked baked cakes, and you can always go and buy a baked cake from this sister in her house. But you can't do that so much anymore. And um, partially because of how the system works, and you gotta have licenses to do this and do that, and because to protect the people, right? That's just protecting you, right? That's what it is. They kill you on the streets, but they're protecting you from being able to make some money and circulate it inside your own community. The point is that there is very little capital circulating within our colonized communities. We experience general economic quarantine by the colonial rulers who regularly do everything possible to destroy the independent economic activity of Africans. They shut down vending spaces and in some places expropriate land used for growing food, etc. That's happening to us in Colombia. Uh, uh, there are places in Barbados where Africans vending on a regular basis, ordinary people but the corporations couldn't get their cut. And the same thing happens in these communities throughout the United States where Africans can't vend. Harlem, they crushed it in Harlem and other places. You can't vend in your own community, sell money, sell stuff that allow money to circulate in your own community because the, now the white people want the money. They don't just send Jews in. They come themselves to get your money or some other entity gets the money that, trans, that ends up being transferred to white folk. We must give serious consideration to organizing this independent economic activity and move to establish popular regulations to promote the safety of producers, products, and vendors. The people within our colonized communities will help us to protect the vendors and producers if the vendors and producers will agree to the imposition of safety, pricing, and courtesy measures that favor the consumers of their products. That simply means that 
we can get an agreement with people who are selling out of their houses, selling out of their cars and things like that, that you can't do bad stuff, you can't treat people unfairly, and this is throughout. We can get these agreements and the people will protect them. We can come to an understanding in our community, that, that doesn't come through magic, we would have to do the political work, uh, that and this will allow money on every front. That's the only point that I make. On every front, we have to push for some kind of economic activity that will allow us to sell to each other, that will allow money to circulate inside our community that takes us off, uh, minimizes the de desperate state of existence we're living in. Harlem, New York, and Washington, D.C. are two of the notorious examples of African population removal euphemistically called gentrification. Throughout the U.S. and the African world, Africans are experiencing a deliberate policy uh, determination to disperse the African population as an assault on potential concentration of black economic and political power. See, we wrote about this in 2017. We, we, we could have been talking about what's happening uh, 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 here where I'm located currently uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, St. Louis. Uh, we could have been talking about someplace else uh, uh, in the world where African people are living. We could have even been talking about uh, um, places in different communities in South Africa. Um, anyway, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and, and move. Uh, that was, that, please take a look at this, uh, all of this. It's really important for us to deepen it. I'm hoping that reading this collectively will give us a better incentive uh, to read it, you know, and understand it. I'm going to page 23, NP down the party's most visible mass front. The International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement uh, is a mass organization directly under the leadership of the party that is the main instrument of leading our mass work. Over the years, NPDUM has been troubled by various contradictions. Our appointment of NPDUM's current president, uh, Kalambayi Andernet, has been one of the most exciting developments for advancing the party's program for mass struggle in recent years. She has been responsible for a significant leap in the membership growth of the organization, which, along with the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, account for hundreds of new members in our mass work. In addition, NPDUM, I want to, I think it's important to, to just restate that. Um, we say that along with uh, the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, NPDUM accounts, uh, accounts uh, for hundreds of new members in our mass work. And that's part of the point that I was making earlier. We're not trying to rebuild the civil rights movement. We're building a revolutionary movement under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. Our movement is much larger than the African People's Socialist Party itself. The responsibility of the African People's Socialist Party is to produce cadre who can lead masses of people, masses of in, in organized life and what have you, who can show the way forward. We become the general staff of the working class, by which we mean that we are that force that can come into uh, organization or even create organizations uh, and then lead uh, in a fashion that contributes to the uh, to carrying out the mandates and resolutions that come from our Congress that helps to build a revolution. And if you look at uh, the party, you look at the different entities that many of which we will talk about uh, if, I can, <laughs> if I can stop these interventions of my own work, uh, we're looking at hundreds and thousands of people who are under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. And I just think it's really important. It's important for a number of reasons. It's, it's certainly important for party member and cadre because it tells us your responsibility. Your responsibility is much greater than what it is that you may be doing in the particular location that you are in. Uh, there are uh, thousands of people who are tied to our mass organizations, to our institutions and what have you. I don't know how many thousands of people come through uh, our One Africa, One Nation marketplace in Philadelphia every year, thousands. And then add to that the number of people who come to uh, the uh, Uhuru Food uh, Furniture uh, Store in Philadelphia. Thousands of people. And these are thousands of people who just, just walk through and make some kind of purchase and walk out. They walk into an anti-colonial institution that advertises itself 
as a colonial, anti-colonial institution, it, uh, they talk about how white people who come through them must be a part of a process to pay reparations, and white people experience going there because they see it as a means of taking take reparations. We're talking about a massive organization under the leadership of the party, and we're talking about this now because the party itself and members itself and the uh, different committees themselves must understand the significance of the work that you do and why you have to push forward uh, doing everything necessary to be successful. That, that's what this is about. And, and we have a responsibility to lead because we have a responsibility to win. It's our responsibility to win. It's not your responsibility just to have a damn meeting or just to, uh, to do an event. It's our responsibility to win. And one of the things that helps you understand winning is because you have the long view. And the majority of Africans do not have access to the long view. They're busy saying, how am I pay the rent tomorrow? They're busy saying, how am I going to get the child to school tomorrow? They're busy saying, how am I going to duck the cops today? I mean, this is the stuff that most of our people are preoccupied with, so most times they don't have the long view. But as people who are in the party, we have the long view. And this political report that I'm talking about now is addressing the long view that we have, and the leaders of our party have a responsibility to take us all the damn way. We use sprinters sometimes in this process, but the objective is to go all the way. And this is what, what we engage in talking about now. So we say in addition, NPDOM, with the assistance of the Office of the Deputy Chair, is negotiating the purchase of a property in St. Louis that will provide for party movement and other rural house. This is it that I'm sitting in right now. This is where you're looking at me from right now. This is the NPDOM forces in uh, St. Louis work uh, to help to pull this thing together uh, that we have now. The long view is what we were fighting for. And we continue to fight for because NPDOM hasn't scratched the surface of what has to be done uh, uh, in St. Louis or any other place that ha where it has to be done. It would be talking about uh, the, uh, uh, negotiating the purchase of a property in St. Louis that would provide our party movement with another Uhura house. It would house economic institutions and an office in the Midwest that will grow our influence there in the Midwest. <clears throat> there are contradictions, however, in the NPDM work that requires our most dedicated attention to resolve. The primary issue is the result, the reluctance of NPDM to properly utilize the NPDM branch building manual for its conduct. This has meant that too much of the work relies on the personal participation of President Kalambayi for continuity and success. Additionally, the entire, and, 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 and I say this about the president, but I want to say more than that, because the people who come into NPDOM, and especially members of the party who participate in NPDOM, must have uh, a, a serious uh, interest in the success of the president, must be committed to the success of the president. It ain't just that we have a president who presides over the meetings and stuff like that, but the president has to be successful. And so we have a responsibility to do what has to be done uh, to make NPDM for go forward. But part of what makes NPDM go forward, of course, is the success of the leadership of NPDM. Either make it successful or bring it down and say it doesn't work anymore, but you can't just be on the sidelines uh, watching you know, things you know, go down, et cetera. Additionally, the entire NPDOM International Exec Committee must be allowed to play a greater role in the operation of NPDOM. This will allow NPDOM to grow much faster and its leaders and members to become more competent in carrying out the mission of NPDOM all the time. Our organization's strength lies on the development and commitment of cadre, our fidelity to the mandates and resolutions of our Congress, and in the case of NPDOM and other mass organizations, our fidelity to holding our annual conventions and conferences. Why are our annual conventions and conferences so important? Because it allows for great participation to the members. So because the group of us is always much more smarter than individuals. So the group must be able to participate. It becomes the property of the group. 
as opposed to just the property of the leader who thinks that we should do this and do that, the organization must also believe in the mission, must also believe in what has to happen for it to be successful. That's why we utilize uh, uh, these uh, committees that we are talking about. All of our organization must also utilize the organization manuals uh, designed specifically to help members, leaders, and organizers to carry out our work in every level of our party and structures. This is our strength, the informed democratic participation of every member and leader of our party and movement under centralized leadership. It is an unbeatable formula that we must adhere to in order to be victorious. And will carries out our commitment to African women. The African National Women's Organization is a major development within the, uh, the party's organization that must be added uh, to the list of constituent organizations to, to be rapidly developed according to party organizational principles consistent with the mandates and resolutions of our sixth Congress. You know, um, there's a lot of stuff that's going on now. It's quite different from, uh, uh, from what it was just a few years ago. And much of what is going on now is influenced by the existence of the African People's Socialist Party. I see us in so much of what I see out in popular, even this stuff I was talking about, the, the, the so-called descendants group and the nation that they now have, and they use the language and they're picking up on components of the theory. And we see other forces do this too. It's a form of revisionism. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a, a form of African internationalist revisionism uh, where they would take uh, the line, take the politics, take, take the theory and distort it uh, in a way to get to some kind of petty bourgeois uh, conclusion that will mislead the people. That's why what we do and when we do it and when we call for it is so important because there are a thousand groups now that's doing African Liberation Day on May 25th and 26th. We had the ability to be out of the gate and have sewn up everything so that the people would have known where to go and why they were going as opposed to a situation where, you know, people, um, other forces are throwing, you know, mud in the game and, you know, trying to get forward. And our objective is to make a revolution, not just to have a damn, a damn march and a conference is to forward the revolution. And everything that we're doing uh, leads to this direction. And the whole question of African women, I mean, uh, the petty bourgeoisie uh, represents itself in a thousand different ways. And every time the working class has a, the slightest uh, opportunity to take power, to make a leadership, the petty bourgeoisie will raise a slimy head and try to take it over and take it someplace other than revolution. Is there any, any person who really believes that African women can be free short of revolution that will free African people? Is there some, some, what is it in somebody's brain that would allow them to think that there can be black women's freedom and no black people freedom? How in the hell does that work? How does some, somebody's brain function in that fashion? It is clear that uh, the, Africa, the party must lead everything. That's the basic point that I want to make. The party must lead everything because the party is the instrument of the African working class. It's advanced attachment to lead the struggle to overturn a social system that is responsible for our oppression and take us to the future of a liberated, united Africa and African people around the world. The party must lead that. Even when it doesn't necessarily look like we're leading, we must be leading that. That's our responsibility. So when we talk about annual African National Women's Organization, we're not some kind of feminist group that somehow believes that you can find some freedom as, as women under white power. How in the hell does that work? How the hell is there's no such thing as women in general? Uh, you know, like the women, uh, uh, my wife's name is Ona. Uh, her name is the same as a, a woman, an African woman, uh, who was given to George Washington's wife as a gift. Both of them are women. There's no, well, they say, well, 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 well Martha Washington was oppressed too. What the hell are you talking about? And hers was an oppression that rests upon the foundation of genocidal oppression, exploitation of African people. And she collaborated with her husband who raped African women who was alluded to have died from pneumonia that he caught uh, while leaving an African woman's slave cabin uh, during uh, some kind of storm. 
Thomas Jefferson and Mrs. Jefferson. You know, I mean, she collaborated too. She didn't shoot him when she found them raping Sally Hemmings. If, well, if sisterhood is all it is, why the hell didn't she shoot him when she found him raping a sister? Because it was my sister and not her sister, and there's no such thing as women in general. So the party's fifth Congress in 2010 actually initiated discussion of ANWR as a response to the oppression of African women and as a tool of the party to bring masses of African women into political life, the party and the revolution. That's what it's for, to bring masses of African women into political life, the party and the revolution. An excerpt from the political report in the fifth Congress stated quite simply, quote, ANWR could become the powerful home to African women who are constantly under some form of assault by a myriad of contradictions uh, peculiar to African women. ANWR would provide a mass organization for women who need to confront their oppression and exploitation. It would allow the party to develop a, a, a uh, reserve for the revolution through helping women to recognize the universal contradiction confronting our people and class that are located in the specific contradictions they are confronting as women. Do you see? We say, yeah, deal with the contradiction of women. Fight them fiercely. No matter how they represent themselves in the world, fight them fiercely. The entire party has that responsibility. But to make sure that all the, other, all the women who are in the leadership of the party, and there may be the majority of the women, the majority of the Central Committee right now may be women who has the ability to impact on everything the party is doing. But so that the woman's touch is everywhere. But to make sure, given the history of this relationship that we have to imperialist white power and what imperialism and white power and white people have done to women, period. White women, yeah, white women have contradictions and problems because white people, the white system dominates everything. But we say that central to every contradiction is the colonial contradiction. Yeah. You get rid of colonialism, you attack colonialism, and so to make sure that this happens in the best way that's advantageous to women. Also, there's an African National Women's Organization that sits on the Central Committee that does not simply have the, the overall responsibility as all the people in the Central Committee have, but to make sure that African women are brought into revolutionary life and to the party. Yeah. So the interests of women are looked at all the time. So we say that, uh, Un and so he, here also the issue of the actual consolidation of ANWR is critical. This means that we must crush the liberalism that allows ANWR to have leaders in the organization in name only, but who do not actually carry out uh, the task of leadership necessary for the effective functioning of the organization. And that's true of every place we look, every committee, uh, whether it's the regional committee, regional leaders, every committee. It's not good enough just to have leaders in name only. Either you're going to do it or you're going to have to move. We have to move this revolution. And it ain't because we don't like you. We, it's because we love you. Because we want you to be free. And you cannot be free sitting on top of our movement and, and, and blocking progress because that's what you're doing. If you're sitting there and you're not carrying out the mission, you're blocking the mission. So we have been criticizing the annual work for some time now. This is because the time is ripe. And we see women participating in political work throughout the world. However, they do not have the advantage of African internationalism and often fall prey to opportunism, especially petty bourgeois feminism. And war and African internationalism have the answer. Women don't have to leave the African Revolution to fight for their advancement as women. And this has been one of the problems of the African Revolution that has allowed African women to be easily led to that feminist garbage because the revolution has not represented the African women in the best interest possible. African women have not been introduced uh, to revolution as a solution to the contradictions specific and particular to African women. And sometimes those contradictions have to do with the behavior of African men. So we're saying that, that women should know you don't have to leave the revolution to fight for the interests of women. In fact, you have to come to the revolution to make sure that the interests of African women are dealt with. 
We say, Andrew can help them to learn this and throw the full weight of our incredible courage, of their incredible courage and desire to resist into the camp of African internationalism. This will liberate African women as critical components and leaders of the revolution to liberate our entire colonized people to their advantage as women. So uh, there's much more that needs to be said here. Y'all got to read it. And then uh, on page 26, we say APDEP, significant mass front uh, in Africa and the US. This, the All African People's Development Empowerment Project is another exciting organization of our movement like ANWO and other organizations and institutions. APDEP provides the party uh, the opportunity to demonstrate the significance of cadre, uh, the forces in whom the party's leadership is concentrated and upon whom the party can rely to unreservedly carry out the mission of the party, not only inside the U.S., but in Africa and elsewhere. In some ways, uh, ABDEP has been one of the party's most popular initiatives. APDEP engages in the kind of practical work that makes believers of people who need to see the immediate consequences of their participation. Despite some organizational problems within APDEP that undermined some of the work in Africa, the APDEP front in Sierra Leone, West Africa, where we operated birthing clinics, schools, and agricultural projects has been significant. APDEP played a hands-on role in fighting against the scourge of Ebola in Sierra Leone and started the process of building the Black Ankh, our own version of an aid organization that contends with the outsized influence of the Red Cross and Red Crescent. Now much of ABDEP's projects and programs in African, African and the U.S. work have been put on the back burner while the organization is consumed with the task of building Zenzele, a consignment shop that would provide an ongoing resource generating capacity entity. Zenzali uh, was also envisioned uh, as the headquarters of APDEP, where the community uh, could shop and volunteer, and where the organization's national and international projects uh, would be showcased. Zenzali can be a powerful statement to the African community of what self-determination looks like. APDEP is led by Kermit's sister Aisha Fields, a member of the National Central Committee of our party. Although she has had no experience in operating a business, Aisha was thoroughly trained for over two years on the operation of the consignment store by deputy chair owners in Aisha Teller and highly skilled and experienced members of her office and successful party institutions. It has taken constant struggle by the office of deputy chair for Comrade Aisha to take the initiative to carry out the work necessary to make Zenzile successful despite the fact that the entire process has been carefully laid out for her and every question and issue was addressed. Zenzile is another tool in the possession of the party through APDEP that must deepen the party's relationship to the masses of our people. It is an instrument through which the party can recruit new members into the ranks of our movement and into the ranks of the party itself. The question of APDEP's success with Zenzile and its projects around the world is still being determined by Comrade Aisha's willingness to lead us beyond an assortment of contradictions that any new project faces. The meaning of the existence of cadre is the capacity of the party to extend this leadership into almost any arena through competent, dedicated comrades who will find the line of march and who will solve the problems of the revolution no matter what obstacles confront us. And I should say, it's necessary to say, uh, that Zenzele uh, is something uh, that has really uh, taken off now. It is a work that is happening uh, with greater and greater success every day. It has become a formidable uh, center uh, in Huntsville, Alabama, where it's located. Uh, it is a community center where people now come for answers, solutions, and in addition to being a consignment store, it is a place for meetings and, and, and is a hub, uh, political and economic hub in that community. APSC, the party's organization of white solidarity. This is on page 28. The African People's Solidarity Committee, the uh, the party's cadre organization, predominantly white people working under our direct leadership, is also facing a major challenge. Key leaders of APSC are not available to take on APSC work directly because they have been temporarily assigned to work in some of the party's institutions and economic work, some, something the growing party membership is allowing us to diminish and eliminate.
I want to say that I mentioned that uh, the office of the deputy chair uh, has has been uh, is an organization that uh, that is defined so much its success uh, so much by its uh, commitment to uh, the mandates, resolutions, uh, the uh, political report to our Congress. This is the thing that makes it such an outstanding entity. And uh, the other uh, committee, organization of the party, that really uh, uh, has the same character is the African People's Solidarity Committee, whose leadership um, um, has also really um, been informed by a stripped down, uh, absolute uh, uh, attempt to uh, drive its work, build its capacity, build its organization, and creative, creative, creatively apply African internationalism and uh, uh, move according uh, to our mandates and resolutions. The, the, the two outstanding entities are the Office of the Deputy Chair and the African People's Solidarity Committee. It's not to say that it doesn't happen in other areas, but these are outstanding entities that can be emulated and should be emulated. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, Due to the rapid growth of the party and the deepening crisis of white society, APSC's mass organization, the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, is, has also grown uh, exponentially, giving USM the appearance of being the determinant factor in our solidarity work. Unless we take this on seriously, we could have a problem of the tail wagging the dog. This contradiction exposes the fact that APSC is confronted with the same issue of organization and consolidation that other uh, committees and organizations face. I'm racing a clock right now, comrade, and there's movement in front of me uh, that uh, clearly helps me to understand that reality. So I'm going to be expeditious, but uh, we may be just a couple of minutes over because I do want you to have an opportunity to raise, uh, to participate in this discussion. <clears throat> um, and I'm hoping that it's a discussion that you want to participate in. Uh, APSC must develop a comprehensive plan to recruit and develop APSC members from the large pool of USM members. There is no shortcut to solving uh, the problem. There is no shortcut to solving the problem. And that's something that we really have to understand because otherwise it, we run down opportunistic roads just sticking people in places and trying to make, and we put bad, sometimes bad people in good places that can be problematic. Um, so we say APSC must develop a comprehensive plan to recruit and develop APSC members from the large pool of USM members. There is no shortcut to solving the problem. Uh, but it does mean that APSC needs to create uh, capacity. Well, it's, it's doing that already, so I, I, don't, I won't belabor this. We need to bring in the members um, in order to hold APSC to the task of organizational consolidation, of functioning according to the established protocols and organizational principles of every other party organization. <clears throat> the problems we have recently encountered within APSC revolve around the need for APSC to function as designed as a cadre organization of the African People's Socialist Party. The political report to the Party Sixth Congress spoke of the work outlined here in the chapter titled, What is to be done? Quote, in summation, to achieve the party's commitment to advance the African revolution that will provide the strategic leadership for the emerging world revolution to overthrow an imperialism in crisis, our Sixth Congress must continue party building as our strategic thrust. Immediately, this will mean developing the existing party committees, organizations, and institutions that now comprise the basic constituent components of our party. Namely, this includes APDEP, APSC, NPDOM, Black Star Industries, and the related economic expressions of the party's Office of Economic Development and Finance. For the most part, the structures, plans, and leadership are in place to develop and or implement this aspect of our party building work. We must simply continue to insist that this work be carried out as mandated under the principles and protocols developed under the One People, One Party, One Destiny campaign. Recruitment strategies must employ the necessary plans for development 
developing the cadre for the success of this work within each of the constituent organizations and committees. So our recruitment strategies have to uh, include uh, uh, plans for developing cadre uh, for the success within each of the constituent organization committees. So uh, more succinctly, we must see the rapid recruitment into the Uhura Solidarity Movement under the leadership of APSC as the tool to go fishing into a deeper pool of ready available recruits. This is an incredible contradiction that we're talking about. We have this massive growth of, um, of USM uh, under the leadership of APSC. What a problem. <laughs> what a problem to have. But it does, it's a statement, though, that you, you know, we have this pool of forces now uh, from which we can you know, develop to come into APSC to become the cadre that's part of the leadership of the entire organization. So uh, uh, the USM forces are the reserve force that we work to acquire. Now we have to determine what it will take for us to concentrate on transforming as many of these forces as rapidly as possible into APSC cadre. Um, so let me see. Let me just say this. APSC is faced with more uh, than organizational contradictions resolved. The solidarity work is extremely important at this time of imperialist crisis. The majority of the entire colonizer nation is in a state of economic organization ideological disarray. This is one of the things made obvious by the presidential election 2016. We know that there's a deep sense of foreboding within the colonizer nation. There's growing drug addiction. These are things that you have to read and understand. You know, you just you really have to understand what is happening within the, the colonial, the colonized nation population and within the colonized nation. What are the sentiments? What are the people? How are the people experiencing reality now? And we say that that's really important if you're talking about making a revolution. Uh, we know that there's a deep sense of foreboding within the colonizer nation. There is. There is growing drug addiction. Addic addiction, and for the first time in generation, if not ever, the death rate of white people is on the uptick. This is real. Uh, the electoral process has not succeeded in bringing them into a sense of control over their future, which appears to uh, be jeopardized by the new norm of economic decline, despite the U.S. government's boast of full employment. This is what we were reading this. You have to be able to look at the colonizer population and understand what the hell it is that we are dealing with in order to move forward. This is evident that for the first time in recent, there is evidence that for the first time in recent history, North Americans of the colonizer nation are confronted with the probability that their children will not be uh, as well off as they are according to a November 2016 report by the McKinsey Global Institute. They didn't have to read that, but that's the truth. The white sense of security that accompanied uh, the belief that the U.S. had hegemony over the world's affairs has been shattered by the defiance from forces as diverse as Venezuela, Iran, Democratic People, Republic of Korea, Russia, China, etc. This whole sense of white people dominating the whole world. Listen, white people didn't have a meeting saying, look, let's talk about how we dominate the whole world. Let's just, just take it for granted, just like air. You just, it's there all the time. You just breathe it. But now we see a whole damn world where everybody is fighting to be free from white power. That is affecting the consciousness, the soul of white people. That's one of the reasons for the drug addiction, the uncertainty and everything that they are experiencing. That and it included, you know, well, I just did include uh, the whole uh, fact that the white population, as compared to other populations, is in a state of decline, not even producing enough children to replace themselves. This is, a, this is a crisis that we are experiencing. Whether they talk about it, they don't talk about it. The Trump administration didn't talk about it. But that's what it is. Even when you see this whole anti-abortion war and how they blow up uh, clinics and stuff like that, <clears throat> like that <clears throat> it is part of a desperation of a population that sees itself on the decline. When I say a population, I'm talking about the thinking representatives of that population. I'm talking about the leadership of that population that pushed this notion down uh, uh, into the depths of uh, how uh, white people see and understand themselves, uh, etc. And how they experience stuff, the competition, the growing competition that ordinary white people 
think they are experiencing with Africans and other people for jobs and for space, you know, uh, for cultural and other kind of space. This is a reality that white people are dealing with right now. That means we are dealing with it. If white people are dealing with it, we are dealing with it right now. When I say we, I'm not talking about the party. I'm talking about Africans and other people in the world. This is part of what we have to understand in order to sum up, you know, the struggle that we're involved in. I have to move forward. So the, Af the work of the African People's Solidarity Committee is occurring within this context. It is work that can represent a major thrust by the party in our effort to advance our struggle against colonial capitalism. We have the genuine ex explanations of the material basis for the gloomy forecast for a white existence built and reliant on slavery and colonialism. And it's a gloomy forecast. It's a gloomy forecast that sometimes it's because the Chinese are on the move. Sometimes it's because the Muslims are on the move. Sometimes it's because uh, there are too many black people are moving in the neighborhood, the immigrants. It's a gloomy forecast. And it's that gloom that, that uh, the current U.S. administration has capitalized on in order to thrust itself into some kind of prominence inside the United States. But that gloom is being experienced throughout the white world, in England, in France, uh, uh, all over the white world, in, in Greece, you know, you see this, this gloom, this, this uh, emergence of a, of a sense of despair and uncertainty. That's the reality, that, that's what we're dealing with. And if we know what we know, where there is uncertainty and gloom on their part, there should be definite clarity on our part uh, because we know that their gloom is a consequence of the peoples of the world taking back our resources, but the peoples of the world have not yet uh, acquired a coherent organization and ideological expression for where it is that we're trying to go. And that's what African internationalism, African People's Socialist Party, is introducing to this discussion. That's something about <clears throat> the significance of all the work that we do and all the committees that I'm talking about now, and I'm going to be a little over. So anticipate that, comrade. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the APSC, let's see. Uh, the work of the African People's Solidarity Committee is occurring within this context. It is work that can represent a major thrust by the party in our effort to advance our struggle against colonial capitalism. We have the genuine explanation of the material basis of the gloomy forecast uh, for white ex existence built and reliant on slavery and colonialism. It is a white existence that is built on and relies on slavery and colonialism. And it's because slavery and colonialism seems to be uh, something that is not working so hard anymore that that is the material basis for the gloom, for the consciousness that we see in the white world. The APSC must discover innovative ways to engage the colonizer population and struggle to see that their future has always been determined by a relationship to Africans and others who have suffered the consequences the consequence of white affluence. White affluence comes directly and immediately from stealing resources from everybody else in the damn world. And if there's a lack of affluence now, you don't change that by trying to find more ways to make war against black people, against other peoples around the world. You better get on our side because we're taking this sucker down. That's what we have a responsibility in APSC to help white people understand. You don't have to be alienated from the rest of the world. Your alienation has to do with the fact that you have stolen and expropriated all the value that our children and our future require in, in order for us to be successful. So you make a choice. Either you're going down with the ship because all of us who are in the ship are doing, we got access in hand, trying to do everything that we can to sink it. So you go down with it or you can engage with us and build in the kind of world that's going to make it possible for all of us to live. Uh, but you're not going, and you're going to have to get jobs, too. So uh, the majority of the white people did not believe in the message of Trump or Clinton and the popularity of Bernie Sanders' campaign that contended most effectively with the Trump appeal to white people is based on a false assumption that whites can continue to have an affluent life under colonial capitalism. That's why Trump was popular. That's why Bernie was Trump popular, because there's some false assumption that white people, if it go this way or that way, we can continue to have an affluent existence uh, uh, under colonial capitalism. And 
Trump was saying we do it this way. Sanders was saying you do it this way. Uh, uh, and and uh, Clinton, you know, uh, had another version of how how uh, we can be successful under colonial capitalism. We're saying up colonial capitalism. It's got it. We're destroying this chump. It's coming down. That's what the world is telling everybody, and and that's what we understand. That's why. You know, it's more, it's not just enough for us to know stuff. We have to do it. We have committees. We have organizations. We have a particular responsibility, and the responsibility is to fight for the future, and the future requires revolution. I mean, and revolution requires the success of the African People's Socialist Party, a revolutionary organization advanced by, ad, ad, led by advanced revolutionary theory. That's what the future requires. The African People's Solidarity Committee is an important party vehicle for exposing this. But this, this is not something that will happen overnight. Whites of the colonizer nation will not simply be, uh, have not simply been waiting for our party to come uh, through with the magic elixir of African internationalism for instant relief. APSC will have to develop and incorporate strategic approach to this very important task. But then again, it may happen overnight. I mean, and what I mean is that we're living in a time where history is compressed, and we're seeing stuff happening. I mean, you know, just between, from, 19, from, from 2014, the five years since Canfield Drive, since these courageous African women and men, young African women and men working, workers, I'm not talking about the students who came in uh, with their capacity to tweet or, or uh, the, the sellouts who came to divert this thing uh, to get more black people elected. Uh, to, you know, uh, I'm talking about those, those folk on Canfield Drive, and I know because I was there. I'm not talking I was there to lead some demonstration from the house. I was there with the people, and they were not talking about that. They wanted fundamental change. That's why their slogan was kill the police, which is the most direct, responsible response that people who are daily being killed, who get killed just because they're walking down the damn street in broad daylight, they're saying, kill the police. And, and, and you know, this is, it's just really important, you know, for us to understand where our responsibility lies and what it is that uh, we have to build. So, uh, the state, uh, of the fractures of the body politic of the U.S. can provide us an excellent opportunity to affect the unity of large sectors of the colonizer population with his own ruling class and with the colonial domination of Africans and the oppressed uh, of the world. Op opening this front of struggle only can only enhance the ability to put revolution back on the agenda within the U.S. And, and the world. So this is important. What we've just described, just in this passage here, because while there are so many people who see the future as being determined by what Trump or the Democrats do, what we are saying is the people are rejecting or trying to reject the Democrats and the Republicans and trying to find another way forward. In fact, I just saw a study by the bourgeoisie just the other day that says 54% or so of all the people in this country want a fundamental change uh, in this country and more than 10% want the absolute uh, overthrow of the system. And that the majority, that, the, that Africans more than anybody else want the destruction of this system. And we, we're around here messing around, you know, uh, not even being able to read the sentiments of our own people and what's happening in this country uh, and the consciousness of people here and around the world trying to find a solution within the system itself. Like even, you know, so that's just ridiculous. I'm going to read a little more because we have to talk about this before we shut it down. The political report to our second plenary, I'm on page 31, uh, of the Sixth Congress spoke briefly but eloquently of what was necessary uh, of our African Socialist International work at this time. Throughout the Americas, our people also, quote, throughout the Americas, our people also suffer an identity crisis that stems from a false national consciousness that has no material foundation a false national consciousness that has no material foundation. We exist in a form of identity purgatory, neither one thing nor the other. 
all hyphenated identities that never sufficiently explain our poverty and desperate conditions of existence. We are Africans, period. The ESI must wage a major campaign within the African world, not just in the United States, because that's where many of us make a mistake of believing that somehow just Africans in the United States have no way African. That's Africans in Africa need to understand that we're African. That's all over the world. That's a contradiction. We've been have this false national conscience, consciousness that has been imposed on us. And that's the struggle that we are engaged in. And if you need any evidence of that, just the, the presentation that I gave on January 24th at Oxford, the debate in Oxford, that's been, that's, that's been viewed by more than two million people now. And the comments that Africans are making, and that comment was on uniting Africa uh, through a revolutionary process. So, uh, we are Africans, period. The ESI must wage a major campaign within the African world, a cultural revolution of sorts. We must wage this campaign in a manner that reveals the heroism and critical role of African workers and peasants, the toiling masses. Our cultural revolution must extol the products, the workers, the, the producers, the workers, the creators of all value and the need for a new society that reinstates the authority of the workers and especially African women from the producing class who are central to all production and society itself. Our ES, unquote, our ESI work has suffered ups and downs. It has not had the benefit of adequate leadership and support from me as its chair or from the party headquartered in the U.S. And then we talk about it because it having to do with the kinds of struggles and opportunities that's opened up here in the United States and then we also say that, um, that uh, on page 31, uh, the bottom of the page, the last paragraph, historically, the most influential communist international was built in 1919 through the leadership of the Bolsheviks uh, that had recently uh, come to power in Russia. Uh, that international had the, the practical and political benefit of Bolshevik state power in Russia. A big, uh, un uh, unquote, uh, a big contradiction we have always faced in building the African Socialist International is the fact that there is no revolutionary African state that can lend its weight to this project. In the past, we made efforts to win the governments of Grenada, Libya, and Burkina, Burkina Faso to participate in this, in this project. It's interesting that the three that we mentioned, that we tried to get involved in this project of building an African Socialist International that will project the interests and uh, 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 of African people around the world and connect us and organize us together. All three of them have been overthrown since we tried to work with them. A split within the New Jewel Movement, ruling part of Grenada, facilitated a U.S. invasion that overthrew the government, imprisoned the surviving leaders, and, uh, and uh, eliminated Grenada as a venue and the poss possibility of the New Jewel Movement as ASI partners or members. A meeting with Thomas. Tomas Sankara, leader of the government of Burkina Faso, was non-eventful, mostly because of the lack of unity by the party envoys sent there who did not effectively carry out the mission of recruiting Sankara to the ASI project. And our attempts to win participation from, from Libya was frustrated by the Libyan diplomatic representative of the Libyan, Libyan embassy in London who demonstrated very little uh, interest in building an international African revolutionary organization. And this has meant that the work to build the ASI has fallen squarely on party resources uh, within the U.S., notwithstanding the splendid work done by party members in other parts of the world. However, we do not have the political and material resources provided by Soviet and Russian state support to members of the Communist International. An example of that support was the $1 million plus annual contributions made to the Communist Party of the United States of America up until the December 26, 1991 collapse of the Soviet Union. The Soviets gave them a million dollars, a minimum of a million dollars a year since 1919. That's how they got their press. That's how the bookstores they had established all over uh, the United States. Uh, they came as a consequence of that. That's how they were able to develop movements for political prisoners that they identified as important. They identified the Black Liberation Army forces 
uh, uh, as gangsters, as bandits and what have you, but they decided what Africans uh, should be supported by the international uh, liberal communist uh, socialist movement around the world. In many places in the African world, life itself is problematic. This means that the U.S. and European fronts of the African Revolution in particular will carry a heavier load in pulling the ASI together. We will play a critical role in the success of the ASI. This is particularly true of the U.S. front. And all of us need to be conscious of that. We have to do what is necessary to contribute to the success of the party in South Africa, in West Africa, in East Africa, and the rest of the world, because we are located in a place where most of the world's resources are concentrated. And that's our responsibility to fight for Africa. And, and we know what it is that they're working with uh, on the continent. And it's their responsibility to do that work, uh, also to make this revolution happen and to share all the responsibilities necessary. Because if we do this thing right, we have the ability, because Africa is starving and poor, but the U.S., China, England, and other white places of the world are rich because of what they get from Africa. So even in a starving, poor Africa, the relationship that we have collectively from the United States and in Africa can move resources in a certain way, can come up with a plan so that we can, we can get resources from Africa, give resources to Africa, all of which will benefit the African Revolution under the leadership of the African working class in the form of the, of the African People's Socialist Party. So uh, I think that uh, I want to just read this uh, from Le Duan, who was a leader of the Vietnamese Revolution. And uh, the Vietnamese, even though it might not be obvious today, this was one of the most incredible heroic revolutionary struggles I believe that ever happened, period. And, an incredible struggle. And, and they were conscious of being able to demonstrate that a small country can defeat a large country. And um, they built what they refer to as people's revolution, where the majority of the people, they won the majority of the people through creating organizations and fronts, just like what it is we are creating in, uh, uh, right now, just like our leaders have a responsibility to make successful because it opens the doors to all sectors of the African population. The Vietnamese did that. You know why they did it? Because even though they were a communist organization leading it, the communist organization assumed the responsibility of liberating the Vietnamese nation, first from the French, who they crushed in 1954, Dinh Binh Phu, and then second from the United States. They led that struggle. They were, and the, the Communist Party led that struggle. And that struggle brought in all kinds of forces from Buddhists, uh, uh, religious people, people who were not religious. They opened the door to everybody who came in under the leadership of the Revolutionary Party. The party must lead everything. Because if the Buddhists alone had been responsible for that revolution, you'd have a situation similar to Iran today. While you can say Iran is important because of what it means to breaking up the trajectory of the United States and hegemony of the United States there and creating crisis for the United States, not a revolutionary entity. And that's what we are building, a whole new world. And so um, I just wanted to read this from Liz Juan. He said uh, uh, in a political document, uh, and my phone is talking to me because it means it's listening to me uh, as well. But uh, fortunately, this is something that we publicize in everybody. So um, he said, after the party has worked out a correct political line. Good morning. I'm going to have to turn it off uh, because it continues uh, to talk to me. <laughs> it won't do it when I ask it to. But, uh, Complete, uh, after the party has worked out a, a correct political line, organizational work in general and cadre work in particular are decisive factors for success 
in the revolutionary task. So you have a correct political line, but if the organizational work and the cadre work do not exist, you got nothing but a line, but a political line. Uh, and then he gave these defining characteristics of cadre. Quote, complete loyalty to the ideas of socialism and communism, to the interests of the working class and the nation, to the political line of the party, the severest sense of organization and discipline, close contacts with the masses, and the ability to fulfill the task assigned. These are the fundamental unvarying requirements in the qualifications of cadre in whatever period, unquote. These are the standards to which our party members and leaders must strive and the standards by which we judge party members and by which we also must be judged. Members of our party do not simply have intra-party relations. We do not simply have the responsibility of acting a certain way with party members within the relative security of our inner party life. We also have the responsibility for leading the masses of our people, of participating in the mass organizations and associations within our oppressed communities, as well as creating organizations of, of the people that require our leadership. We are not casual bystanders and cheerleaders on the sidelines of history who only record political events as they occur. We are architects of the unfolding milieu, helping to define and guide it every step of the way according to the African internationalist analysis. We must lead Uhuru. So I know I'm over time. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, I'm hoping that, that you remain uh, uh, just a few minutes longer so that we can have discussion and you can participate in this discussion if you found uh, something here that you think uh, deserves uh, your attention. Uhuru. Uhuru, comrade. Uhuru. Uhuru, let's salute our leadership, Chairman Mamala Shatela, for that powerful study. Uhuru. So let's acknowledge our viewers, um, salute our, all of our viewership. We will first like to acknowledge our viewership we have um, to salute comrades watching in Miami, Florida, St. Petersburg, Florida, Tampa, Florida, Gainesville, Florida, Fort Myers, Florida, Nairobi, Kenya, sorry, Nairobi, Kenya, Chicago, Illinois, Springfield, Illinois, Huntsville, Alabama, Portland, Oregon, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Occupy Azania, South Africa, the Netherlands, our, <clears throat> in our live studio right here in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Uhuru. Uh -huh. um, just got a few questions, uh, well, comments first. We're gonna, uh, hold on one second. So Jackson Hollingsworth in St. Pete says, Uhuru. Jackson from USM, St. Pete, salute Chairman O'Malley Yashatella, okay? And I'm gonna, I want to get to this question. It's, it's really important to me to get to this question. Um, we've had a lot of comments, but Olafin and St. Pete commented in question, could the success of the solidarity movement be due in part to the stolen wealth and resources hoarded in the white community? Similarly, the reparations institutions within the ODC I unite that these are organizations to be em em emul emulated, but are there other factors to be considered? I don't understand the question, I'm afraid. I don't understand. Could the success? Could the success of the solidarity movement be due in part to the stolen wealth and resources hoarded in the white community? The existence of the solidarity movement is due to the stolen wealth in the white community. I don't understand the question. Uh -huh. That's why they are there. Uh -huh. That's where all the resources of the peoples of the world, or most of the people of the world are concentrated in some white community or another uh -huh. someplace. So uh, I'm, I might be hearing that as a competing or question. I don't know if, it, if you're saying success compared to what? Some and, and what is success? Because we, haven't, we don't have the reparations yet, and we, don't, we haven't 
mobilized the millions of white people uh, under the leadership of the party yet. Mm -hmm. So the success of the Solidarity Movement is due to the leadership of the party. Uh, hold on. Okay. We have uh, Tafari McGarry, chair of the African People's Socialist Party, and uh, says, Occupy Design says, thanks for the stern leadership, comrade chairman. Also, we have Abdullah, St. Louis, um, sorry, Springfield, Illinois. The circulation of money in our community is similar to blood circulating through our veins and arteries. Any part of the body not receiving blood will atrophy and die. Similar, any part of the community where money does not circulate will atrophy and die. Yuhuru comrades who have taken on this giving, this life-giving work of creating economic development and growth. Uh, we have questions here. Uh, River Sayatadi. Uhuru. Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman. Um, I had a few things. First, I wanted to um, appreciate the way that the party is designed. You were talking earlier about like how we clone ourselves, so like one person being taken out doesn't kill the whole movement. And in my mind, I pictured this, um, this uh, it was like a monster or something, like the Hydra in the like uh, stories of like Hercules and stuff, and, like how you cut off one head and then two more grow back. And I just appreciate the party that through creating these manuals, these trainings, um, these political reports that we can rebuild, even if there's a time where the leadership is taken away, we have all of these things in writing and in place for us to go back and retrain ourselves and to clone ourselves over and over again. Um, I wanted to unite. Let me just say that uh, you have you have that written down, right? So you're not going to lose your train of thought because this is one of the issues and struggles that uh, uh, confounded me in the 1960s. As much as I appreciated Malcolm X and what have you, I couldn't find anything that he wrote that helped us to know how to organize or what to do, and uh, nothing like that was left behind. And that was one of the problems I found in general about the African Revolution that made it necessary for all the writings and things that we've done. And part of the writings, too, that we've done was not just to be able to quote uh, dead white people or even dead Africans, and, uh, but to uh, to be able uh, to craft the way forward. And this is what we talk about when we talk about theory. We have to understand uh, our place and destiny in the world. We have to have some understanding. And uh, that's what we call theory. That's what we call philosophy. And, uh, uh, and it has to be scientific philosophy because, uh, for example, people uh, in the Bible, people who will read the Bible, and they say, well, the Bible tells us something about our place and our destiny. And our, if we're good, our destiny is heaven. If we're bad, our destiny is hell, uh, something to that effect. Well, there's no way we can characterize that as scientific because it is not something uh, that you can test it. You know, I mean, uh, you can't, there's no way that you can measure, you know, uh, success or failure. It doesn't describe, give us an understanding of the world that we live in. We, we uh, uh, use uh, historical materialism, means by which we examine, first of all, examine the world uh, and then uh, uh, analyze the world. And if we, using that process, the world that we examine, we recognize it came into existence through slavery and colonialism. Mm -hmm. That's how it came into existence. The world that we live now is a consequence of slavery and colonialism. Mm -hmm. The world we live is miserable as African people. And the same thing is true with most people on the planet Earth. While the world that the colonizer, white people live, is um, uh, obviously much better. And so uh, understanding that this world is constructed off that, it gives us the ability to know how to take it down. It gives us the ability to make a prediction. We can make a prediction of the future, not based on how many prayers we pray. Mm -hmm. We take the future in our own hands. We can predict that we can have a good future as African people if we destroy this system and all of the things that hold it together that came into existence uh, through the process of enslaving and denying us a future. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I wanted to say that. Go ahead. 
I wanted to unite with what you were saying about this uh, whole ADOS question and that like um, this idea of like African descent of slaves minim minimalizes our lineage as Africans um, and like kind of just dismisses the fact that we existed before we got here and were enslaved and dissolves the fact that we were stolen, like kidnapped and displaced to suggest that like there weren't African slaves in other places or that they don't matter because we here and suddenly we're a totally different entity, like we Americans now. Um, and just that that's a tool of separation by the petty bourgeoisie and the bourgeoisie. And the question that I had was you mentioned commandism and I was wondering if you could deepen what that means or if it's the same as dictatorship. Well, you know, there's a way that uh, we can make an error of trying to uh, make things happen simply uh, by commanding that it get done. And uh, uh, as opposed to uh, using uh, the process that we've established in terms of democratic centralism, uh, where people uh, have an opportunity uh, to discuss and come to uh, conclusions about under the leadership about how and uh, things should go. Now, I don't want this to be confused uh, with the right and responsibility of leaders to make decisions and our responsibility to follow that leadership. I'm not trying to say that every decision that a leader makes has to have a committee uh, to get involved in deciding it. It won't happen in that fashion. But the process that we use in uh, most instances is one that stems from a collective uh, uh, participation. Now, we have Congresses, and we have uh, other kinds of uh, committee meetings where we come up with a general direction. This is a part of the whole democratic process. Everybody in the party and everybody in the world who wanted to uh, had an opportunity to look at our political report to discuss it. The same thing was true with even the political report to our plenaries. They discussed it, they agreed or disagreed with it, and then the people in the party voted on it and said, this is what we want. Then we have uh, the elected leaders who have the basic responsibility of making sure this stuff is carried out. And we give uh, the leaderships the authority, all of us do, uh, to, uh, to uh, push and uh, make this happen. Uh, that is the centralis centralism and the democratic centralism. Dem democratically, the whole party came to uh, agree with this, and then uh, the, we elected the leaders who have the responsibility of making it happen. And we have the responsibility of following that leadership. And then that works itself down all throughout the ranks of the party, all throughout the structures of the party. And I mentioned the Congress, but there are other entities and things that we pull together uh, processes um, uh, to uh, uh, elaborate on how the work is going to be carried out. In every, every place that's possible, we bring in uh, the participation of the organization. We have people now that I'm concerned about, just in terms of some of the work that's supposed to be going on, where it appears uh, that without uh, the committee having uh, uh, come together and made certain decisions, just individuals go off and do uh, what it is that they want to do and uh, without even the leadership of the committees knowing what the hell is happening. That can be problematic uh, as hell. Uh, it means that you don't have a unified body. It means that uh, the body has not agreed to do it. It means it's your project, but if the people in the region have not discussed it and agreed with it, it's not going to happen or it's not going to happen effectively. I've over-talked that on purpose. Uhura. Acknowledge the uh, they just joined a live stream in Massachusetts. Hello. Is yeah. that Boston? Streaming in Boston, yeah. Just want to acknowledge them and they say a hoodoo to the chairman. A hoodoo to that. Um, another question for the chairman. Can you say more about how this political report defined? what the office of the deputy chair was to carry out. One, helping the people understand that groups of Africans coming together to acquire property in the community through economic cooperation. I'm looking at the, see how much, how much we're over. Can I say more about? 
<laughs> yeah. Okay. Can, Go ahead. okay, I'll repeat the question. Can you say more about how this political report defined yeah. what the office of the ODC um, deputy chair was to carry out, helping the people understand that groups of Africans coming together to acquire property in the community through economic co cooperation? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a difficulty that we have because uh, um, even as the system is attacking us on every front, it teaches us um, individualism. It separates us. It doesn't uh, allow us to recognize the significance of working together to solve problems. And in fact, it creates, helps to create distrust among us. And it creates institutions uh, that will uh, reward uh, people who break up the unity of the group. It creates institutions that would literally reward somebody for coming in and breaking up the unity of the group. And one of the problems that we have, and this is really strange uh, speaking to uh, people who, for whom collective economics, this is how, how we have existed for most of our history as a people on the planet Earth, uh, we have to fight for that, have to get rid of distrust. And, and also, we don't have leadership because uh, the thing is, this is part of what makes the party significant, is that we're getting hit on every front, every place in the world. Uh, our resources are being stolen right in front of us, and we don't have a capacity to respond to it collectively. That's why you have to have the party everywhere. There has to be a party in occupied Azania, uh, and not just in general terms, but in every community in occupied Azania has to be one within the United States. And we watch, uh, for example, a place like St. Louis, uh, where it's one of the most, no one of the gr most glaring uh, cases of, uh, of land theft, robbery, uh, worst kind of corruption, growing the immiseration of African people on a daily basis, uh, pushing us out of communities, uh, deteriorating housing stock everywhere, uh, and a growing move by developers uh, and, and uh, rich white people to take that housing stock. Uh, even with scams like they call it a dollar a house, uh, the scam that the, the Africans say, wow, we got a dollar a house. They have to do something because they got all of this housing here, but then they got to show a democratic process that you can get a house for a dollar if you repair it and do other kind of stuff. But they, to get the plumbing done is, uh, is, is, is often $10,000 job itself. To do different other, to get the roof, you know, you took it and all this kind of stuff that people uh, would have to pay. So they really, even though they, it appears to be available, they don't qualify for it. Uh, but who qualifies for a dollar a house? It's the developers, the corporations and stuff like that that's going to come in here, but Africans give this false sense. Uh, they're getting something, and the African politicians and office holders uh, uh, are able to hoodwink the people into saying, look at what I've done. I've made this housing available for a dollar. Uh, uh, you just didn't get it. You know, that kind of stuff. So what we're saying is that uh, we have to have the ability, and I'm just using St. Louis, but Washington, D.C., the African community is disappearing. Uh, ba I mean, Baltimore, the same thing is true of Harlem. All this stuff is happening right in front of our faces, and we don't have the organizational capacity nor uh, uh, leadership uh, to be able to, uh, to combine our efforts. Uh, for economic uh, uh, participation. And collectives and cooperatives is just an incredibly important way that we can do this that brings in a large sector of the population uh, to unite with the acquisition of these properties uh, in a way that's going to uplift the community, house our people, and give people jobs uh, repairing the housing uh, in the process. We've got all these abandoned houses. We're talking about how much it's going to cost. And then uh, uh, doing that and having a political front you see, the, politi the political, you say, uh, politics is concentrated economics. So our political movement, our political drive is to force the government uh, uh, to deal with this collective that we create uh, to turn those, not only turn those properties over to us, uh, but also to make the requisite monies necessary uh, to repair those houses, to put them in, in the uh, possession of these collectives and cooperatives. And what else do we do? We, we deal with uh, uh, not just create, only creating houses, but like I said, employment. And one of the things that's striking about St. Louis is the huge number of, uh, of uh, persons, uh, contractors, the small um, uh, plumbers and, and carpenters and people with these uh, uh, talents and ability to do stuff 
but they don't have anything that they can work to do it with, we can create full employment uh, through this kind of cooperative economic effort and then winning African people to cooperate together. Uh, sometimes to come together uh, to, so that you're not afraid that if, if we put my resources or my money or my something here, that somebody's going to take it or I'm going to lose it, uh, et cetera. Uh, but winning African people uh, through conferences and through uh, the kinds of meetings, collective meetings uh, that we can do to build movements uh, that would help that. Even in St. Louis, we're engaged in something that's called uh, the Keep 28 uh, is a fight for black power. And this is because uh, the white uh, uh, power had uh, an election, I think something like 2012 or 13 or something like that, that uh, went over the heads of the African population that, so that the white people effectively voted uh, to have, to, uh, to, quit, to cut the number of uh, wards from 28 to 14, cut them in half. And this obviously is a means by which they would dilute the black vote. Uh, so that they would neutralize it, and now they're in the problem, in the process, and they're talking about it like it's a natural and normal thing, of merging the city of St. Louis with the county. And again, this is an attempt to dilute the black vote. So black people and politicians of every stripe uh, uh, is working with them to make this happen. And it's because the African working class does not uh, yet have the kind of uh, organized leadership that we need to keep it from happening, but the Keep 28 campaign is a campaign that's designed to fight to make sure that we can put back on the ballot uh, this idea of, of uh, cutting uh, the number of wards. Uh, and uh, uh, this committee, uh, this campaign could also initiate uh, the kinds of uh, efforts we're talking about in terms of uh, helping people uh, to come together collectively to purchase and accumulate properties and other stuff to fight back against this encroachment on our community. So uh, is there anything else? Otherwise, we'll- One more question. We deal with this one. This is the last okay. one. Uh -huh. Chachara Musimba in St. Louis says, Uhuru Chairman, can you speak to those who think that we can change our conditions without joining organizations? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, that's a, a, a really important question. Uh, I think that more and more Africans are being uh, pushed into organization. I think that most of our people understand the significance of organization. Uh, the working class understand the significance of organization just in terms of how things happen in our daily lives. We've got even African young people who organize these street organizations that they call gangs who, because they recognize the significance of organization, regardless of what it is uh, that they have uh, defined as their objectives, to control this turf or that turf, but organization is critical. It's the only thing that uh, we have. We have nothing if we don't have organization. And even we've learned from time to time that even having a lot of money uh, will not save us from the consequences of colonialism if we do not have organization that can speak to our interests. Organization gives us the ability uh, to define what our collective interests are and to collectively pursue those interests. Uh, and you cannot do that without organization. The only thing you can do without organization is define what your interest is. Uh, your interests are as an individual, uh, but your interests as individuals cannot be defended unless there's an organized capacity. And that's why organization is so critical. That's why the party is so critical. And that's why I want to appreciate everybody for participating in this study. I know that uh, I've taken you much longer than uh, what you planned to be uh, in this discussion. I hope that it proved uh, to be fruitful. Uh, and thank you. Uhuru. 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 We want to just appreciate uh, everyone who is tuning in to uh, Facebook and YouTube and also appreciate <clears throat> all of your engagement. Please continue to invite your friends and family to this study and share widely on all of your social media platforms. And uh, we have announcements right now. Because of, time, because of the time we want, you know, any questions that were not answered, um, one of our moderators will correspond with you and make sure that the chairman sees your questions. This study was brought to you by the Department of Agitation and Propaganda, 
winning wars of ideas. For your worldwide revolutionary news and analysis, visit theburningspear.com. For Revolutionary Radio, dynamic shows and music by Africans all around the world, tune in to Black Power 96.3 FM, broadcasting out of St. Petersburg, Florida. Love saying that. And accessible via the Black Power 96 app for Apple and Android or online at blackpower96.org. Did you unite with what you heard today and want to learn more about how you can get involved with the African People's Socialist Party? Visit APSPYuhuru.org for all information regarding how you can apply. Join the Freedom Mass Choir and Band. The Freedom Mass Choir and Band is an all-African community group of singers and instrumentalists that sing songs of resistance and revolution. Members are located through the United States and attend weekly rehearsals both in person and via live stream and video. Sign up by emailing blackpowerchoir at gmail.com or call 727-537-6736. Order your copy of Chairman Amalia Chatella's latest book, Vanguard, The Advanced Attachment of the African Revolution, the political report to the 7th Congress at burningspearmarketplace.com. Book Chairman Amalia Chatella for the Vanguard 2019 International Speaking Tour by contacting at info at amaliachatella.org or call 727-914-3621. So start planning now to attend African Liberation Day at tradition of <clears throat> a tradition of the African People of Socialist Party, May 25th through the 26th in Washington, D.C. The theme is Take Africa for Africans at Home and Abroad. Death to Imperialist White Power. <laughs> Love saying that. <laughs> and and um, we'll include a march as well as presentations from Chairman Amalia Chatella and ASI Secretary General Louise, is it Kinshaze? Did I say that right? Good, Louise Kinshaze. For registration, lodging, and transportation information, visit aldyahuru.org. Sign up for the Marcus Garvey Legacy Cruise. The Marcus Garvey Legacy Cruise is the annual fundraiser held to support the work of the African, African Socialist International. The African Socialist International is an organization made up of African people locally vir lo located virtually on every continent, <clears throat> dedicated to overturning the conditions faced by African people <coughs> worldwide. <coughs> this year's cruise will be taking place from December the 14th through the 19th and we'll be sailing on the Carnival Sunrise from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, staying overnight in Havana, Cuba, and visiting NASA Bahamas. Registration is now open, and deposits can be made by calling the travel agent Linda Stern at 732-972-4171 if you want to further support the ASI and the Marcus Garvey Leg Legacy Cruise. Make a donation by visiting yahurulegacycruise.org. I know I did. Thank you for tuning in. Make sure <clears throat> you like, the, like and subscribe to the Burning Spear TV on YouTube to catch every episode of Amali Taught Me Sunday Study. Yahoo! Uhuru. 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 The revolution is real. It's live. And as some comrades say, it's lit. Right? <laughs> Lit. Lit.
The revolution is lit.